morning. I want to just briefly introduce you to both the uh, Pakistan Private Sector Energy Project, as well as PFAN, uh, which is the implementing organization for the project in Pakistan. Uh, both of these organizations and projects are essentially project preparation facilities. PFAN has been working globally since 2006, and in that time has raised somewhere in the region or just over $2 billion of investment for clean energy projects globally. Uh, that equates to around 173 projects uh, uh, worldwide. We started work in Pakistan earlier this year, uh, and we've been, uh, I think, making good progress in the country, and in the meantime, have already developed a pipeline of some 22 projects in the country. Uh, and those projects have a total investment ask of 270 million US dollars. Uh, PPSC and PFAN are technology neutral. Uh, we understand and know that there is no silver bullet solution for the energy transition. And we need a portfolio of technologies and finance solutions to get us to our goals uh, and, and meet the Paris climate change targets of 1.5 degrees centigrade. In the other countries of our operations, Globally, biogas has played a really important role in helping PFAN uh, raise finance and meet some of the, those targets in the countries that we operate in. And we are convinced that biogas has an enormous potential in Pakistan. And indeed, we've identified the sector, uh, the rural waste to energy sector, if you like, as one of PPSE's key priority areas for the next years. Having said that, we know there is much work to be done and the sector is still very much in its infancy in Pakistan. And that's the reason I think we've invited you all here today as policy experts, project developers, researchers, investors, donors, to give us your unique perspectives, uh, offer your expertise and help us together perhaps unlock some of the potential of this great sector in Pakistan. We know there are many challenges, challenges of feedstock supply, price volatility, logistics, infrastructure, the choice of technology itself. Scale is a real challenge in this sector, and we've seen this in other countries. And the financing gap itself, the lack of capital, and the difficulty in mobilizing capital into these sectors is really challenging. And this is the reason for the PPSE being in existence to, to help fill that gap. In particular, in this workshop, in this roundtable, we'll be looking at the use of biogas for generating energy in the private sector to support agriculture and product development. <coughs> Thank you all for giving your time and expertise. It really is greatly appreciated. We value this. Uh, and we look forward to a very vibrant discussion, frank exchange of opinions in helping us develop solutions for accelerating investment into the biogas sector in Pakistan. Back to you, Santiago, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Peter, uh, for the remarks. Now, uh, I, would, uh, I will walk you through some housekeeping rules for this webinar. Uh, and then we'll get back uh, onto the session. So um, as you might have all seen, the session is being recorded and it will be make, uh, made available afterwards uh, with our broader audience. Um, after this webinar, we will be producing a white paper piece um, with the key findings, outcomes, and discussion items out of this workshop. Um, we will invite all people in this webinar uh, to participate as signatories uh, for that document. We will circulate the draft, and after all your inputs, the, the document will, make, uh, will be made available uh, for, for everyone to consult and for the open, uh, our open stakeholders. Um, I will ask you during the discussion, uh, when we finish the, the first round of first presentations, uh, to please uh, activate your camera if you feel comfortable with that uh, later on during the discussion, and to keep the image in the center like uh, you're seeing mine. Um, and I will upload again the, the virtual background of this webinar in case you want to use that. Um, 
I will also ask you to indicate your name on your tag uh, here in Zoom. I see more, most of you have already done that, uh, so that's great. Um, I will ask you during these uh, first presentations that we are not yet discussing to please keep your microphones muted uh, so the, the sound quality for all is, is better. Um, um, when, uh, when we are already in the discussion, uh, facilitated by Dr. Ina, uh, you will all have the chance to contribute and to speak. Um, and when you start speaking, uh, we will recommend you introduce yourself, uh, stating your name and name of your organization. That should be enough so people have context of, of who is speaking. Um, if you have connection issues or, or technical issues, please let me know uh, through the chat uh, so I might be able to, to help you. Um, you can use the raise hand function uh, to request permission to speak. And I would also like to state while a good part of this webinar is in English, uh, you can also come in and share comments or do questions in Urdu. We will try to keep the session bilingual uh, as much as possible. Um, you can type in uh, comments or questions in the chat box that we have. Um, I will please ask you to turn off your phone or your laptop notification uh, during the session. And uh, once again, I'll encourage all participants to keep their cameras on uh, when we're already in the, in the round table discussion provided uh, our inputs. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our, our next speaker, um, Ms., uh, Dr. Chitra Rajan. She's um, one of uh, PFAN's success story, a project developer from India. Uh, and she's the managing director for Radif uh, Life Spaces. Uh, over to you, Dr. Chitra, please. Uh, thank you, Santiago, and uh, a very warm uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and talk about a topic which is very, very close to my heart, and I'm very passionate about it. I'll start with uh, quickly talking a few uh, words about... Uh, about my background. I have spent about two decades in uh, IT industry. The last stint was with uh, HP, handling the new business initiative for uh, US and Europe. Uh, after that, I bought a coffee estate and that's where my journey into uh, this renewable energy field started. Uh, I had about 250 acres of uh, coffee estate and coffee, if, if a few of you must be knowing, is a yearly crop. And it uh, to get the beans out, we put it through a... I'm sorry, uh, kisi ka, uh, piche music chal rahe. So kindly, agar aap apna speaker mute kar de, to bahut mehrbani hogi. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chitra, over to you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the coffee, you no, know, we uh, to take the beans out. It goes through a process, uh, you no, know, uh, where we remove the outer covering. And uh, during this process, for every kg of bean, uh, we get about 750 grams of the waste. And this waste is usually thrown out of the estate because it generates a lot of heat you know, when it's getting decomposed and people used to just throw it off. So my I, uh, thought was, why waste a good organic matter? And uh, I decided to set up a biogas plant in my uh, estate and uh, use this organic waste. The mistake I made was that I didn't realize that um, for biogas to uh, you know, be uh, ready, you need about 25 to 30 degrees of uh, ambient temperature. And in a coffee estates, it rains for about three to four months continuously. So the ambient temperature drops and uh, my plant stopped working. I didn't want to waste the uh, no investment which I've already made. So I shifted the plant to my penthouse, the you know, terrace of my penthouse. And that became a talk of town and uh, every uh, newspaper in the country covered it. And a lot of people started coming in because uh, and to see it because it was some, a novelty thing. One thing led to other and a lot of... Uh, uh, educational institutions came and asked us to set up plans for them. And that's where uh, we thought that this has a very good potential uh, as a commercial uh, business and uh, we got into it. Opportunity is really, really big. <coughs> because, uh, this is the most cost-effective way of 
handling wet waste in the world. Uh, any other uh, solution like incineration is energy intensive. Composting requires a lot of land and a lot of time. So this that leaves only this uh, you know, biogas as the only viable alternative for handling waste all over the world. Uh, since this is a, a symposium on uh, biogas, I don't have to talk about uh, how it can be used. You all know it can be used for thermal use uh, in uh, cooking and uh, in uh, running furnaces, or uh, you can use it for electricity or even uh, for uh, running your automobiles. Uh, this is again as a no-brainer. Everybody can understand that. This is the most environmentally friendly way of handling um, uh, large scale of uh, wet waste. It's cost-effective way of uh, handling it. In the, on top of it, uh, we are getting clean energy. And uh, we have a large customer base who can use this energy. Uh, as far as technology is concerned, it's still the industry is still at a nascent stage and a lot of scope is there for improvement. And I have made uh, my own uh, improvements in this field. So, uh, which I'll be talking about it later. Uh, as far as the threat is concerned, yes, if the petroleum prices go down, uh, it could be a little bit of a threat, but that is something I don't think we have to worry as of now in the near future. Uh, EV technology can be a little bit of challenge, but what we are seeing in India is that uh, we think that in the next three to five years, 90% of our two wheelers will be converting into EV, uh, but our uh, long distance buses and trucks will still be using fossil fuel. So what we are trying to do is we are going to be focusing on uh, three wheelers and four wheelers as our target market, which itself is a huge market. So the threat is fairly minimal. What did we do uh, different? Uh, we brought in a little bit innovation into that. Uh, we have uh, identified some effective microbes, which increases the productivity uh, of uh, or the production of gas by as much as 30%. And uh, we have uh, come up with a new bottling technology which re reduces the cost of bottling by uh, as much as 50%. Because bottling, the compression and bottling is the most expensive part of the bio-CNG project. Uh, the other pro no, innovation what we have done is we use FRP, that is uh, fiber reinforced plastic to make our digesters instead of uh, you know, steel or uh, cement that uh, not only uh, cuts down the time for erection of the plant, but it also makes it easier if we want to shift the plant from one place to another, we can dismantle it and take it to another place. So this is the innovation which we have brought. My journey so far, we started it in 2009, but the first five years uh, we spent on R&D and we had set up smaller plants at that point of time. And in 2014, we decided to set up a big plant. And that was my first plant in Bangalore, uh, which uh, today processes about 40 tons of uh, uh, wet waste and produces two tons of uh, um, uh, purified methane. In 2019 only, we could start our the second plant because one because of COVID and then there was financial issues, which I'll be talking about how it's difficult to raise funds for projects like this. So uh, I set, set up my second plant, which today produces about six tons of uh, um, purified CNG. And we are now trying to uh, take it to 15 tons. The trial phase is going on. We are setting up one more plant in uh, Punjab, which is uh, where the land and all has been already identified. Apart from that, there are four more locations where we have identified in Karnataka with the state where I'm staying uh, to set up. So that uh, my ultimate aim is by 2030, we should be producing 100 tons of uh, uh, bio CNG every day. Uh, th this is my second plant. And one thing I'd like to talk about here, which is I'm very proud about here, is that you all know that uh, 50 to 60% of uh, the biogas is methane and another 30% is carbon dioxide. Most of the people just harvest this uh, methane, which is the fuel which we use. But the CO2 part of it is just let off. I didn't want to waste this CO2, which is about 30% of the gas which, uh, which is produced. So we have captured that. And now we are probably the, one of the first uh, no, bio CO2 plant in the world. This will be a food grade bio CO2. So we are in the process of again, testing it at, at this point of time. Now I come to the most important part of uh, this uh, talk, the challenges which I face, because this is what I suppose uh, most of the people here will be interested in uh, knowing. Like any other business, I also faced a lot of uh, challenges and I still face it. Uh, for the bio CNG project, the most important pro problem which we encountered, encountered in the beginning was the steady supply of feedstock and consistency of output. We all know that uh, any organic matter can be used to produce methane. 
But uh, what is uh, important here is that each feedstock has a different uh, output which it gives. For example, if you, are, if you want one ton of uh, bio CNG or CBG, which we call, uh, you need 20 tons of food waste. Or for the same one ton, you need uh, 18 tons of chicken litter or 50 tons of cow dung. Now to get a consistent supply of uh, a same feedstock throughout the year is difficult. And at times it's you know, dangerous also, it's risky when you're just depending on one feedstock. For example, your uh, whole plant is based on chicken litter. And we have seen in multiple uh, times that there are times when uh, for some disease, the entire uh, chicken litter, chicken uh, farming with chickens die. And when it starts, the whole area, that all the chickens die at the same time. Within a matter of few weeks, everything is wiped off. In those kind of situation, we feel that it's very difficult to, or dangerous to just uh, depend on one feedstock. So, uh, and to have a consistent output, what we have done is we have come up with uh, microbes, which can, uh, which we can use to tweak and make sure that we use a no, no, multiple feedstocks at the same time. I can use chicken litter, I can use cow dung, I can use food waste. I also use ice cream waste and I use food uh, waste from food processing industry. All of this, I can combine it together because uh, everything is av not available throughout the year. Like if I'm looking at, uh, say, paddy straw, paddy straw is available only three months in a year. So what we do is we use a combination of all feedstock. And all I have to do is tweak the uh, microbes a little bit so that I get a steady supply of uh, or consistent output throughout the year, irrespective of what my feedstock is. So that's how we handle the uh, first challenge. Uh, technology definitely is a challenge because uh, in this you know, uh, region, we have this uh, tendency that we look to West for technologies. What we do is uh, whatever is working there, we could tend to bring it here and then make it work. But one, that is very expensive. And secondly, the, uh, the, the climatic conditions are different in that country and it, it doesn't work in here. So what we have done is that we have designed our own um, compressors and purification unit, which are cost effective and more reliable. So that's how we handle the second one. Finance is definitely is a major challenge. I couldn't get finance for at least first four years because the uh, institutions felt that this is a very ris risky business and not many success stories are there out in the market. And of course, being a woman definitely uh, had its disadvantages because they felt that my priorities towards my business will change and if I start at some point of time, I'll start uh, focusing more on my family. And this is where PFAN helped me a lot, is that my mentor uh, did a lot of handholding. He helped me and tutored me to how I can present the uh, you know, uh, business plan and the financial model to the investors in a way they can understand it. And he advised that instead of going for an equity investment, I should go in for a, um, a debt uh, investment. And uh, that's how I raised my funds. And I'm very glad and happy that he did that because today I run a big company and I own the entire company. I have 100% uh, equity with me. And uh, market extensions again, is a very, very big challenge because when we started, the first we were targeting uh, commercial kitchens for selling our uh, gas. And we had a lot of challenges there because uh, people were not ready to take it. They said, look, the color is different. The smell is different. It doesn't you know, burn like LPG. So to educate each and every customer became a, you know, a mammoth task. So uh, that's where when we went and uh, spoke to our uh, uh, government here, and they came up with a new scheme called Sustainable Alternate uh, Towards Affordable uh, Transport, which is Satat scheme, in which uh, they have directed all the oil companies in the country, the major oil companies like Indian Oil Corporation, Bharat Petroleum, HBCL, Gale and all, that anybody who produces two tons or more of uh, bio CNG, the petroleum company will completely buy it lock, stock and barrel. And they will sell it through their bunks. And the, the LOI, which is the letter of intent is given to people who can set up a minimum of two tons of uh, gas. The process is very simple. You apply for it if you can uh, su uh, supply two tons of gas to them. Uh, they will identify a bunk which is less than 20 or 25 kilometers from your plant. And all you have to do is take this gas to the bunk and they will sell it. And you will get, uh, uh, no, um, the uh, purchase guarantee is given for next 15 years. 
they'll buy it at the same cost. And uh, any escalation in uh, the uh, oil prices, they will escalate the cost. But if there is a, the prices drop, uh, the oil companies will not reduce the price. So that way you have a purchase guarantee for the next 15 years. So that makes it more viable for this project. And that was a major push this industry needed. Of course, our, uh, we have a ministry for uh, 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 natural resources, MNRE, and uh, they also give cash subsidy, the capital subsidy, subsidy for setting up plants. So in the end, all I can say is that Biogas addresses two very big challenges which uh, every country in the world is uh, struggling. That is waste, waste management and uh, access to clean energy. And this technology addresses both these issues. And this technology can be replicated anywhere in the world uh, with very little disruption to the existing infrastructure. The, so having said that, I'll say uh, one more this thing is intervention of the government and policymakers is very, very essential for the success of uh, the sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, for that insightful presentation and for sharing uh, your experience with us. Um, that was that was really, really helpful. Um, now we'd like to move to the next speaker, uh, last speaker, because then we'll just be moving to the roundtable discussion with all the participants. Um, now we're going to cover biogas technical and market insights from Pakistan, and we have the honor uh, to have Dr. Ravi Aliquat from USPKs uh, as a speaker. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ravi. Hello, everyone. Can you uh, see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm Dr. Rabia Liakat, working as an associate professor at US Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Energy at National University of Sciences and Technology, uh, Nast Islamabad, Pakistan. And uh, thank you to the PFAN for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about the biogas technical and the market insights from the Pakistan side. Uh, so, Dr. I will Rania, start with. Can you, yes. uh, can you uh, put the presentation in? presentation mode um so I we can see the the, the bigger screen ah, so, that's great thank you so much okay. thank you uh so i would start with the issues and the motivational factors at the same time which pakistan is facing like other uh, asian countries like the energy crisis climate change decline in the fossil fuels and to look for the economical resources and to meet with the greenhouse gas emission and to address the uh, waste which is generated uh, through the environment friendly practices to have the sustainable environment. Uh, so for that matter, the solution other than the renewable energy, we will I will particularly talk about the biomass, which is the uh, any organic decomposable matter which could be derived from the plants or the animals, uh, which is uh, available on the renewable basis. Uh, but to select the biomass for the generation of bioenergy or the biogas, there are a few questions which needs to be addressed to move forward. That why biomass is the option, which biomass we need to go for the bioenergy production, and where is that biomass actually located in your region or the country? And then the feedstock supply and the biomass assortment is are the few questions which we need to address on. Uh, so, uh, commercially, the organic waste solutions which are currently being in use is the recycle and the uh, dumping, which basically generate a lot of CO2 emissions through the landfilling process. And it is very laborious and high service cost, and it uh, generates a lot of CO2 emission. And again, it becomes uh, only a waste in the environment. So, bioenergy basically gives an option for the lower service cost and local lower uh, kilometers cost and CO2 emissions and then there is an option that we can produce a renewable energy in the form of the methane or the biogas. So what we are basically focusing on in Pakistan uh, to valorize the waste materials and we say that waste is a resource basically. So why biomass is basically it offers the potential for high yields uh, of bioenergy and it's an economical uh, fuel availability option and it have no adverse environmental impacts and suitability to modern energy systems and this basically act as an economic and social 
uh, uh, stimulus and the stability factor for the particularly for our rural community. So the biomass cycle basically maintains the carbon cycle in the environment. That's why we say that the biomass is a carbon neutral fuel to move on. Uh, so regarding the feedstock, that which type of feedstock basically we are using in Pakistan and can be used for the bioenergy generation is the dedicated, that would be the dedicated energy crops, uh, agro-industrial waste, agriculture residues, forestry residues, and the municipal solid waste. So the important point is to look at the feedstock types, the feedstock production, and the sustainable basis of the uh, biomass availability. As already Dr. Chitra has uh, discussed that. So uh, in Pakistan, we have the four crop seasons, basically. Uh, so maintain the sustainability, we have to go for the uh, co-digestion of the waste materials. So what is bioenergy? This is basically converting the organic waste into clean and green renewable energy. Uh, and it basically closed the carbon uh, loop cycle by addressing these four, four components. So biomass mass in Pakistan, so uh, we have talked about that why biomass. Now, where is the biomass in Pakistan is located and which type of the biomass? So we are basically having animal, lot of uh, abundant animal waste, municipal solid waste, agriculture crop waste, and the forest wood residues are the present. So uh, we have wheat straw, rice husk, bagasse, poultry cow manure, and the municipal solid waste. And currently the technologies which are basically uh, used in Pakistan are the gasification, uh, combustion and gasification technologies, hydrolysis, fermentation, composting, uh, and these kinds of tea technologies are being in use in, currently in Pakistan, and we are generating the SNG off grid electricity generation. Uh, we are using the bagasse as a renewable motor fuel. And uh, can you see my slides? There was some interruption. The slides are fine, but we can't see you on the video. I mean, it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, you can try. Now we can see you. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. okay, thank you. So we can produce the biogas, we can have the methane uh, as a household fuel. And uh, there are the solid uh, use of the biomass as a solid fuel, that, like the people use the pellets of the biomass and directly burn that. But uh, that is not a, a good option in case of the environment. So uh, if we talk about the biomass availability in Pakistan, so Pakistan is currently having 26,800 hectare land is under cultivation according to the World Bank statistics and which support the economy of 62% of people who are living in the rural community. So by the help of uh, Alternative Energy Development Board, Economic Coordination Company Framework has used the bagasse uh, as a substrate and they have the uh, plant capacity around 15 megawatt to 62 megawatt of uh, uh, energy generation through eight sugar mills and four energy companies are involved in that. And then the independent power projects framework is existing and they are using the bagasse and also they are working on the waste to energy pro projects and they are producing 12 megawatt of the energy. And in that uh, three private bioenergy companies are basically uh, involved in this sector. So uh, for the availability of the biomass, Pakistan is having a biomass atlas uh, that is currently uh, existing and it was funded by the World Bank and along with the AED, AEDB and some other consulting partners. Uh, they, have this, they were basically having the aim of energy sector assistant management program was to map the potential in Pakistan for industrial scale power generation on biomass. So they have used the satellite image analysis, field surveys, and the other GIS modeling. So according to that, the type of residues which are mostly present uh, in Pakistan are the uh, cotton stock, wheat straw, rice straw, sugarcane trash, and the maize stock are the major uh, residues, crop residues, which are available to produce the energy. So total um, gigawatt of energy which we can produce is the 96,000 uh, gigawatt of energy can be produced by using these residues. So here is the table which is uh, representing the uh, potential 
uh, of the sugar mills in Pakistan uh, in different provinces in Punjab, Sin, in KPK, and the, their districts are also mentioned here, and the sugar mill industries. Uh, so they have they are producing a lot of uh, bagas, and they have the uh, power capacity to uh, generate the energy by using that. So uh, total, they have 10,000 uh, uh, tons per year. Uh, basically, they are generating the bagas, which could be used for the energy generation. So if we compare the uh, Pakistan's total primary energy supply through uh, biomass in different countries, so here we can see that the Pakistan is having an enormous uh, potential to generate that. And that if we compare the biomass energy potential in Asian countries, so we look that, uh, so in, for that matter, Bangladesh is on the highest one, then China, and then uh, Pakistan is having uh, 0 0.806, uh, uh, person uh, availability for the generation of electricity. So biomass types and the availability. So uh, by using the LEAP model, Pakistan basically have projected the availability of biomass till 2030. Uh, so for that, we have the minor crops, major crops, and also the animal livestock. So if we look at, so we have a lot of potential, uh, biomass potential available. Uh, for the uh, energy generation. Uh, so as we are talking about uh, the uh, missing puzzle of biogas in Pakistan, so we can see that in the year till 2016 and 2018, there was around 73% uh, capacity utilization of the bio, uh, uh, bioenergy uh, in Pakistan. Uh, this is basically the, the data is from the arena. Uh, uh, linked with the Pakistan uh, particular report. And, uh, and we can see that the net capacity, uh, which has been changed in 2020 in megawatt generation is that we have no, uh, not, no production from the bioenergy sector. So we are mainly focusing on the hydro and marine and also solar is increasing uh, its uh, capacity in 2020. So uh, the topic is very relevant to work on that we need to have again the share of bioenergy uh, in Pakistan. So traditionally biomass is basically uh, directly burned by the rural community and it tends to have very low co conversion efficiency. So we are basically wasting our uh, potential. So there are different conversion technologies which are right now available uh, as we have already discussed related to the fermentation and thermochemical processes. Uh, but the two main technologies which are right now uh, adopted in Pakistan at the commercial scale, that is the gasification and the anaerobic digestion technology. So uh, now I have the list of few government organization and private organization and along with the universities who are working in the development of bioenergy. Uh, like we have the in government sector, we have Directorate of New and Renewable Energy, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Resources, Alternative Energy Development Board, we have PCSIR, and the PICRED, Pakistan Council for Renewable Energy Technologies, who have worked a lot in uh, uh, biogas, uh, basically the digesters design and their implementation. In the private sector, we have Renewable and Alternative Energy Association of Pakistan, engineering resource company, uh, then MG Engineering Associates, then we have Transmark International Private Limited, Sky Green uh, Engineering Agrotech, and for the university, we have NED University of Engineering and Technology who are working in this, my university, National University of Sciences and Technology, University of Engineering and Technology, Comsats, UF, they all are working uh, in the bioenergy domain in R&D sector. So Pakistan was, uh, having a uh, national biodiesel program uh, by the financing of the National Bank of Pakistan. So they were working on 20% biodiesel with 80% petroleum diesel, uh, that is termed as B20, uh, to uh, run their agriculture uh, transport on this uh, biofuel. By, and they were producing the ethanol by using the molasses. So then in Pakistan, we have also an option of third generation of uh, biofuels, which is related to algae to hydrogen production. So we have different strains of algae available, which could be used for the hydrogen generation as well. 
So now if we talk about the biogas market, so there are uh, market drivers and trends which leads us to move towards the biomass that is the growing adop adoption of woody biomass for heat generation, increasing participation in the Paris Climate Agreement as Pakistan is the signatory of Kyoto Protocol in Paris Agreement. So we have to move towards the renewable options and then uh, waste management using biofuels and biomethane and expanding share of bioenergy and electricity generation, rapid growth of the global transportation sector uh, as we are moving towards the EV and other hydrogen fuel cell cars like that. So rising investment in renewable energy sector is also one of the driver to develop the biogas market in Pakistan. So if I talk about the bioheat market uh, here, in, so here you can see that in Rawalpindi with the help of the in, uh, in Rawalpindi, with the help of the Pakistan Council of Renewable Energy Technologies, uh, different small uh, units of the five and three cubic meter of the biogas plants were installed there and also provide the gas to the rural community to meet their daily kitchen needs. And the effluent which is coming out of uh, this was used as a bio fertilizers to grow the organic uh, feed. So nothing is zero in this technology, basically. And then Pakistan, China is having 100 kilowatt of biomass gasification plant, which was developed by the help of the uh, Jeff and Junido. And if I talk a little bit about the history of biogas plant, that how they have developed that we have started the, the design of fixed room type uh, Chinese design in 1970s, and then it goes to the 2000 in 2009 to 2015. We have biogas system developed by the Pickett and they have installed 5,360 uh, household units in the Punjab. Uh, and then there were different NGOs were involved in that to disseminate and provide the awareness to the rural community. So the standards two family size models of biogas plant, three cubic meter and five cubic meter were mostly uh, installed here. So here are the, these two, uh, there are different types of the basically biogas plants and the dusters which are being in use, but uh, on the commercial scale or at the rural community, which are most commonly used in Pakistan are the fixed room type biogas plants and the floating gas holder type of the biogas plants. Uh, so they have their own technicalities and uh, pros and cons and depending upon the availability of the land, also the substrate and what you need actually we select these uh, type of the biogas plants. So uh, if we talk about, and that was all related to the biogas, like in the form of the heat, but we have the biopower market also uh, here that we can have small and large heat uh, power production units. And also we can have combined heat and power plants. And th th these are already been existing in sugar mills here. So uh, now a little bit about the techno-economic modeling of biomass gasification plants for small industries in Pakistan. Uh, this project was funded by the UNIDO and we have worked on that and in which we have the techno-economic analysis related to that and this is related to biomass gasification. So average IR for a 100 kilowatt gasification plant for all fuels considered is 22.3%. And the average NPV for the same is estimated to be 21,000 US dollars for all the fuel types have been considered. And uh, so among the fuels, corn star and hybrid fuel were considered for that matter. The sensitivity analysis on fuel sourcing radius suggests the recommend and recommended the sourcing radius to be around 19 kilometer with uh, break even at around 25 kilometer for all the installed uh, capacities and the sensitivity analysis on gasification plant efficiency suggest the uh, and recommend the efficiency to be around 35% with the break even reaching at around 28% for installed capacities were the considered. So for feedstock to energy services, we have to manage the biomass feedstock uh, planning consents. Then funding and finance is very important. And for that matter, we have bioenergy conversion plant and we can give the energy services to our community. And now I will briefly explain about the uh, requirements for adoption of biogas technology in Pakistan on the larger scale are linked to the policies and institutional arrangements. 
uh, financial constraints are there, then availability of the inputs, which is related to the feedstock and their supply chain. Uh, this is one of the very important uh, point. I, I, as I have closely worked with the community and many data analysis and surveys as well. So one of the major hindrance point to adopt this technology on, uh, by most of the people is to lack of the uh, success uh, stories or to properly communicate the reason of the failure. So it's not the, uh, the failure is not in the um, technology. Basically, there are few points that people have the poor design and construction of the biogas installations, wrong operation and lack of maintenance by the users, lack of project monitoring and follow up, and the lack of ownership responsibilities by the users take to the failure of the technology and lack of skilled personnel and lack of instrumentation and automation system to monitor uh, the performance of the digesters and lack of troubleshooting sources uh, if we have the little bit problem. So for the rural community, uh, education uh, is more important to educate them and their capacity building to operate the biogas plants. And then awareness and capacity building is very important that if we have the job creation in this sector, so people will uh, come to this side. So uh, how we can develop an integrated bioenergy policy for that matter, we have to have the uh, transport sector on board, waste management, land utilization, agriculture and rural development sector along with to make it the energy access to the uh, biogas. So uh, yes, so this is all from my side. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravia, for that uh, insightful presentation. It certainly brings us um, context uh, for the, the discussion we're about to onboard now. Um, now, uh, before I hand uh, over to Dr. Hina, uh, the, the moderator for the questions and the roundtable discussion, um, when you request uh, the raise hand function or ask to speak, uh, if you find that you have problems to activate your camera or your microphone, uh, please just drop me a message on the chat so I can assist you technically. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Hina, please. Thank um, you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, if I may, uh, Dr. Hina, can you uh, hum, agar repeat kar sakein, uh, in Urdu what Santiago just said? I can do it, or if you would like to do it. I think you can do it, and then I will yeah, request sure. Santiago to show the presentation on the guiding. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, while he does that. So uh, just to translate, ke Santiago kya keh rahe the, ke, uh, agar aapke paas koi bhi question hai, uh, ya aapko koi bhi technical difficulty aati hai, to aap uh, ye jo chat wala function hai, usme aap apna question likh sakte hain, ya jo raise hand function hai, uh, us tarah kar lein, uh, kyunke ye ek moderated uh, session hai, ke hum ek dusre ke upar baat nahi karna chahte, to isli please apna, um, aap, you know, interject na karna, uh, so please aap, aap uh, hume chat mein aap likhte de sakte hain. Thank you very much, shukriya. Thank you, thank you Mavra. All right, so um, I think Dr. Um, Chitra and um, Peter and Dr. Rabia has uh, already set the scene on the biogas um, um, uh, potential, um, the challenges, the barriers, technical market insights. Now we want to go to a moderated session in which we require uh, the participation of all the participants who have joined us today. And if I see the numbers, there are plenty. So uh, there are good numbers, above 30, um, who we would like to um, share these guiding questions with and to you know discuss it further. So these four questions are just we will talk about And I would like to begin with the first one, which is what is the current status of biogas in Pakistan? So what is the recent, in ke dor mein, uh, Pakistan ki, uh, ki context mein biogas ka kya status hai, what's the positioning, kya uh, recent uh, development hai, kya recent advances ho rahi hai, future perspective se kya hai, uh, which business models and technologies are working well and um, what are not working uh, and why aren't we doing much uh, more with the biogas. 
कंसिडरिंग के पहले से हमने पहले भी प्रेजेंटेशन में सुना इट हैज अट ऑफ पोटेंशियल कंसिडरिंग और क्लाइमेट एक्शन कंसिडरिंग और एनर्जी नीड्स रिसोर्स कंजम्पन बर्डन वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट सो हैविंग ऑल दो बेनिफिट्स जो कि बायोगैस के हैं उसके बावजूद हम पाकिस्तान में इसका स्टेटस अभी तक कैसा है कौन से बेस्ट टेक्नोलॉजी या मॉडल है जिस पे जो हम ऑप्ट कर सकते हैं सो इसमें जैसे पहले सेंटियागो ने भी मेंशन कर दिया कि प्लीज रेज योर हैंड्स एंड आई डू सी कपल ऑफ रेज्ड हैंड्स एंड आल्सो आप लोग अगर चाहें तो क्वेश्चन आंसर स्टैंड बॉक्स में भी अपना क्वेश्चन पोस्ट कर सकते हैं ऑल्सो योर प्रेफरेंस टू स्पीक इन इंग्लिश उर्दू इंग्लिश में बात करना चाहें उर्दू में बात करना चाहें ये आपके लिए फ्लोर इज योर्स आई वुड लाइक टू बिगिन विद खलील साहब हु आई सी दैंड रेज यस खलील साहब कैन यू हेयर मी यस थैंक यू सो मच फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वॉन्ट टू थैंक यू ऑर्गेनाइजर्स for inviting me to this uh, gathering secondly our two opening speakers i want to congratulate them for making uh, excellent presentation and dr chitra's uh, presentation was at a what we might say industrial level whereas our experience with the rural sport programs network has been more at the household level but i will say a few words about our experience in the context of this uh, these questions in pakistan we started work in 2007 8 by running a pilot project in sialkot with about 10 households we used fixed dome technology and the plant size was 10 to 15 cubic uh, meters uh, khalil sir uh, i would request you please uh, when you say we uh, can you please uh, give a brief introduction of your organization also okay thank you uh, the rural sport programs network is a network of nine organizations working across pakistan in all the provinces and all the areas our partners include national rural sport program sarhad rural sport program sindh rural sport organization baluchistan rural sport program the aga khan rural sport program in gilgit and few other partners and basically we follow the community driven approach to development we mobilize local communities into uh, various uh, institutions at the local level mahalla level village level and union council level our outreach is across 149 districts of pakistan in this particular case in 2007 snv from holland they contacted us that given their experience in nepal they wanted to test biogas in pakistan and we were very willing so we did this pilot in sialkot with this new technology in case of pakistan of fixed dome previously we had this uh, floating dome technology and which didn't work for various reasons so when we started our uh, program we did a baseline assessment we did a full appraisal and as uh, dr rabia mentioned there is a huge potential for biogas in pakistan and especially at the household level we came up with an approach which was market driven approach all the previous attempts at biogas had been heavily subsidized 100% subsidies and hence you know when in pakistan the political economy is such the local influentials get these free gifts from government and then don't look after them don't manage them properly plus there was no backup system in case of any maintenance and operation issue so given the experience of snv in nepal we came up with an approach market driven whereas on one side would be 
awareness raising about the importance, benefits of biogas. On the other side, the supply system. And we as RSPN had a quality control function. So we did a lot of awareness raising. And during that, we found that people were very apprehensive about biogas. They had heard that basically it was a failed technology. So given that experience, we had to spend a lot of effort in holding dialogue, having conversations. In the first year, we were able to install about 40 biogas plants in central Punjab. On the supply side, we identified <clears throat> masons, we trained them, and we signed MOUs with them about their responsibilities, especially about the quality of the work, and that our uh, engineers would verify their uh, quality, and then we would release the 20% quality control uh, component. So basically the households paid 80% of the cost of the plant, and we paid uh, a small 20% subsidy as part of quality control incentive for the biogas uh, masons. As the word spread, the demand came up. And next year, we went to 150 plants. And as these biogas uh, masons were getting more orders, we converted them into what we say BCC, biogas construction companies. And they took on extra masons and we trained them. So in, in the fourth year, we worked with about 2000 plants. So we had a system of in place of awareness raising and on the other side of uh, supply system. So that worked quite well. However, many farmers were willing to buy biogas plants but they were facing capital, financial uh, cash flow issues. So we prepared a proposal to take to various microfinance institutions. We even had an incentive of 2,000 rupees incentive per biogas loan. But as somebody mentioned in the presentations, the microfinance institutions are like big banks, very conservative. They like working with the people they know, the trades they know. So nobody was willing to enter this uh, biogas financing uh, domain. So in six years of operations, we couldn't convince one microfinance operator to give one loan for micro biogas plant owner. I think uh, the technology is there. The, the supply system can be easily put in place, but the financing system has to be developed, whether we are talking at the household level or talking at the higher level. While we were working, initially our focus was on meeting the demand for household energy for cooking. However, given the cost of diesel and other fuels going up. Many farmers wanted to use the biogas plants to run their water pumping operations. So this required higher, bigger size of biogas plants. So we sent our team to China and they learned a few things there, came back. And then we started installing 25 cubic meters, 50 cubic meters, and recently, some of the biogas companies have installed 100 cubic meters uh, for these uh, large dairy farms. So I think uh, slowly the awareness has come up that this uh, energy source, the technology is good, is working, awareness is there. Now we need, as we heard in the case of India, that without government, support government, government policies to complement uh, these private sector initiatives, we won't go far. So I think uh, there's a huge potential, but everybody, as Dr. Rabia mentioned in the last slide, everybody has to come together, 
And without that, it yes. won't take off. Thank you so much, Khalil Saab. And I think building on um, what you have said, I would like to um, merge it with the next question we have. If um, Santiago, you could um, go on to the next slide because um, rightly mentioned about the potential and the, your experiences of the biogas um, dissemination at the household level, there are barriers in terms of um, finance. So this brings me to the second question and then I will take um, um, the, the participants who have raised hand as well in, com in combination to the last question I've already asked. So which avenues to finance um, exist in the current market for biogas and which gaps needs to be filled? So we do have identified gaps that earlier presenters and also Khalil Saab has mentioned already. But um, let's hear from Peter. Uh, you wanted to add on something to what Khalil uh, Saab was mentioning and uh, also in the context of the, the, the current question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hina. Um, the, uh, the, the point I wanted to pick up on was on the area of microfinance, and we have seen this in many other markets, you know, and, and we fully understand the challenge uh, for microfinance institutions for providing finance into the household sector. One of the, and we actually worth considering uh, sort of presenting this uh, case study today, we, we worked with a company in Cambodia uh, it's actually an Australian company, but their, their main operation is in Cambodia, and they're distributing uh, household level uh, self-contained uh, biogas units uh, together with uh, cooking, cooking uh, appliances. And they actually packaged, packaged the microfinance into their business offering. So they offered, when they went to the households, and they were principally looking at small Households with, with sort of a, some some livestock uh, that supplied the feedstock, uh, they actually went to the household and offered the technical solution and the finance solution in one in in one package, uh, and we helped them raise funding to sell more product, but also to be able to offer the the microfinance solution. And I was just wondering whether we've seen any models like that in Pakistan. Um, and if not, are there institutions, are there uh, some of the companies that I think uh, uh, Mr. Tetley was uh, telling us about, you know, could we work with some of these institutions, some of these, um, I forget what he called them, but the, uh, the sellers of the biogas plants, could we work with them to develop such models? Because I think, you know, this might be what the market is, is requiring. Um, open question. Thank you so much, Peter, for, for sharing this. I think quickly I would like to give um, a chance to Umar, Umar Ghaznavi, um, who I can see the raise, raised hand. Yes, please. And I would also request the participants to keep your intervention for two to three minutes um, to allow the other participants to have a chance as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. My name is Umar Ghaznavi. I'm the co-founder of Dawam Private Limited. Uh, both my partner and I, um, are both a Czech experience, right? Biogas, may. we started off uh, working on the Landi biogas project in Karachi for K Electric. Uh, my team was the one that uh, initiated that project, and now it's been taken over by the SIN government, which they plan on developing for a large-scale biogas setup. But I wanted to point out point out karna tha, jo, uh, the, the presentations that were made and the information that's been shared. I have a very different view. Uh, I tend to look at biogas more from a large scale perspective rather than micro solutions. I can understand uh, that in rural areas, we might have more micro solutions that might be suitable for the Pakistani market. But when you talk about the metropolitan areas, there are certain problems faced with biogas projects, which we tend to ignore uh, when we're looking at all the positives associated with biogas. One of them being uh, foremost being the collection of the feedstock. Uh, the first presentation pointed out about uh, the need for standardized feedstocks and that is not very easy. Uh, there is a lot of waste out there, but when you go around trying to collect it, and we've had that experience as a waste management company. Once you try to start collecting that waste, uh, it comes up with a whole bunch of other issues. 
um, at the sourcing level. And then uh, I think one of the things that gets uh, overlooked over here is that once you've taken out the biogas, you're left with a substantial amount of slurry uh, in the case of a wet digester, and you're left with uh, the remaining material, uh, the solids, which can be used as compost, of course, but that requires another, the development of another market for uh, biocompost uh, across the country. In Pakistan, we estimate around 150,000 tons of municipal waste is collected. And by our estimates and our work in the last four to five years in the waste management sector, 60 to 70% of that is organic waste. Uh, doing solutions which are micro-based is very difficult to deal with that kind of volume on a daily basis. Just collecting that waste has an in, has a very high, very significant cost attached to it. Uh, and then moving the slurry and the leftover solids from the digester into the market, that brings an, another set of expenses. From our experience, we don't believe, and I might be breaking a lot of hearts here, but we don't believe feeding uh, the gas pipelines or feeding the grid is a cost-effective solution. And one of the major reasons why we are unable to secure financing or equity investments for these projects, I am a former investment banker myself, uh, is that you, you don't have a model which works without a subsidy. Uh, our cost for power is too high from biogas compared to other uh, competitors like solar or wind. Uh, particularly in Pakistan, solar and wind uh, have attracted a lot of money uh, and at a much lower tariff rate, they're able to provide better profitability for the investors. So the question becomes, does it really make sense to put it in for just power generation to be sold to the grid? We are in favor of producing uh, captive power for any plants which might be using the organic waste. And secondly, as a fuel for vehicles, uh, for the collection of waste, both municipal and uh, agricultural, as well as uh, the distribution of the byproducts that we collect on that. That's my three minutes. Yes, thank you so much, Omar. Uh, and thank you for considering the time. And really good um, input, especially to highlight um, the role in terms of finance, that the challenge we have, um, the biogas, um, uh, the, like, the um, production of um, energy and electricity from the biogas and in, in comparison to the other renewable sources. So it is subsidy driven and um, the policies, enabling policies and sorted out. Uh, next, I would like to give a floor to Yaya and then Ubaidur Rahman to um, give your inputs and then we can um, move on to the next question. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Hina. Uh, Dr. Chitra talked about uh, uh, non-availability of funds for the biogas she was exploring. So the challenge that uh, our local uh, environment mein, this remains a challenge to get finance, especially from the fin uh, formal financial sector. Biogas, uh, Pakistan, mein, it uh, emerged uh, to talk uh, in the end of uh, uh, late 50s. Uh, we have been talking about uh, various uh, projects and development sector has been doing something to promote this, but unluckily this could not get momentum. Uh, flow of information and knowledge uh, in recent times has uh, been uh, uh, available and it has reached to the masses. So now this is a new era, era and environment uh, to revive this concept, uh, which of course will be uh, beneficial for the economy and the environment as well. Uh, finance ki baat ho rahi thi. There have been few challenges uh, which uh, banks, uh, bankers generally uh, face. Bada issue ye hai ke bankers don't have the understanding of the business. So when we talk of the capacity building uh, about this program, I would strongly urge that bankers must be engaged for understanding of the business. Unless they understand the business and dynamics, uh, they will not be able to uh, get into the uh, lending propositions. Uh, over the time, there have been few uh, initiatives by the Central Bank and the Government of Pakistan, uh, which enables the smallholders, uh, rural enterprises, and even the uh, commercial uh, entities uh, to seek finance for the uh, renewable energy. Uh, I would like to talk a few are for the smallholders. Uh, for example, uh, Prime Minister's Kamjao Joan scheme. This is an initiative 
whereby financing to small farmers uh, say up to 1 million of rupees is now available at a subsidized rate of 3% per annum and that too is without collateral so i think this is an area uh, which needs to be uh, plugged into your programs to provide access to the finance and banks by now are quite uh, uh, positive about this program and they are lending to this uh, uh, small holder community so financing up to 1 million of rupees collateral free at a subsidized rate of 3% is now available for a period of 5 to 7 years and then there is another program uh, which is offered by state bank of pakistan this is uh, their refinance scheme for women entrepreneurs so financing exclusively to ladies is now available up to 5 million of rupees and that to on a subsidized markup rate of 5% only and uh, that the loan tenure is 5 years so i think these two uh, avenues are quite attractive for the uh, rural enterprises especially the women and there is another important uh, uh, initiative of the central bank that is their refinance scheme for renewable energy that is a program whereby banks can offer uh, loans to three categories of uh, uh, end users and that loan is available for a period of 10 years and that loan is for the small businesses medium enterprises and even corporates and even for the entities who want to uh, build set up for generation of power for onward lease or sale to the uh, end users or even the government so there are few initiatives which are quite uh, attractive and the market is now i think conducive to get benefit of these uh, financial developments taking place in pakistan for in last 2 3 years yes thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank you yaya yeah, and thank you um if i could pick up the um, two main points is one of the um, one about the capacity building of the financial institutions the bankers um who needs to understand um the 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 model and the profitability also uh, the, the initiatives jo ke hamara state bank ki taraf se um uh, renewable energy ki financing scheme hai iske alawa uh, for the rural enterprises and women they are incentivize loan um, schemes um, uh, to promote this uh, i will get back to um, this particularly in my next question but let's hear from ubaidur rahman um on the uh, avenues to the um, finance um the current challenges and also uh, after that dr chitra so ubaid yeah, if you could please unmute yourself oh, yeah. uh, thank you so much dr hina my name is ubaid and i'm from a uh, sustainable development policy institute so uh, i would like to be very brief here because the angle i am highlighting is somewhat that is more close to the first two questions so uh, what i would like to mention is that when we talk about financial and generation potential of biomass or biogas in this case i think what is being overlooked over here is the resource intensification of biomass in pakistan i mean we recently did a research study with uh, university of engineering and technology text on levelized cost of electricity of biomass and a very interesting insight was that the feedstock cost in some cases contributes to even more than 50% of total per unit generation cost but uh, unfortunately in pakistan along with the challenges as uh, already highlighted by dr rabia regarding technology and capacity to use it we have a comparatively poor resource intensity as well i mean why is the crop cycle and crop yield of pakistan very low as compared to its neighboring country even the snap study which dr rabia highlighted it was very clearly mentioned that the technical potential of bioenergy in pakistan uh, actually drops to only 25 to 30% of that theoretical potential which is generally which is generally mentioned so this is again something which we really need to focus on uh, definitely the areas which we need to further improve so that was something for my side thank you okay thank you bay then dr chitra if you could please yeah uh, i just like to uh, add a few uh, points here uh, i would like to share uh, what uh, my experience in india see we also started in the same way we the government focused on uh, individual household uh, level uh, biogas plants in the rural area that's where we started and there here also the government was giving 90% subsidy uh, for uh, entrepreneurs to set up or individuals to set up biogas plants in the house and as expected 90% of them failed one because uh, people are not serious they, they many 90% of them many of them use it to take the money from the government but they never set it up second was you know handling a biogas plant on a day to day basis requires a lot of discipline 
then how much quantity of waste should go, what kind of a waste you can put in, what you cannot put in, at what time you put in. All these requires a lot of discipline, which it was, we found that it was very difficult to you know, make people, individuals understand it. So what we felt was, uh, you know, in, instead of focusing on the individual level, if we uh, focus on the community level, you know, you set up a, you know, a biogas plant for a village or maybe a, a set of villages and interest the, uh, the responsibility of running it uh, to the women, it works much better because what happens is they are the end users because uh, whenever you're setting it up at the rural uh, area, it's used for cooking. So they are the ben direct beneficiaries of it and they have the control over the waste which goes into the plant. So they have a lot more discipline. So we found that it definitely works very well when you do it at the community level. So this was uh, one point which I wanted to talk about. And yes, we also face the same uh, situation that electricity generation using biogas is not a very uh, you know, commercially viable option because like uh, Pakistan, even in India, the electricity is subsidized by the government. So as long as people are going to get subsidized electricity, they are not going to pay a higher price from uh, for uh, getting by, you know, electricity from any other source. That's why we have uh, moved away from supplying electricity and then we have now started focusing only on uh, providing it as a gas so that you can use it for multiple purposes. And yes, waste is a challenge. Uh, as, as long as you're able to identify the waste and then you segregate it at the source, See, as the moment it gets mixed up with other waste, it's next to impossible to segregate it. So you need to target the waste generators, especially the bulk waste generators, and make sure that it doesn't get mixed up with anybody else, any other waste, then it works very well. Because my plant in Punjab, we process about 500 tons of waste every day. And 500 tons is collected by uh, individuals who you know we have appointed. So there is no government intervention here. There is no local bodies intervention here. It's private enterprise and everybody is able to uh, contribute to it. So uh, if you're able to uh, have the buy-in from the local people and they see a benefit in providing waste to you, uh, then your project will be a lot more successful. So that Thank is uh, our experience here. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for, for sharing your experience and focusing on the community level for this purpose. And also highlighting one of the very important point on handling and the maintenance of the biogas plants is need to be um, really uh, taken care of at this point. Um, and these um, small issues uh, sometimes do not feel um, uh, to, to be, you know, really considered. But these are some of the issues at the, you know, practical side of the story where we um, need to be mindful of um, how we are doing it along with the um, other mechanisms and along with the other challenges that are being faced. So we have uh, Mr. Khalid Mahmood who has raised his hand. Um, Khalid? Yes, I think you yourself. can hear me. Yes, I can. Okay, so um, I would take the reference from uh, Dr. Abhya's presentation that she mentioned that uh, one of the issues uh, in penetrating biogas systems in Pakistan is lack of success stories. So either it is on household level or industrial scale. Uh, in a project together with the um, NEST, we looked at industrial scale biogas plants in Germany. And then we have like uh, good success stories, but unfortunately we could not manage to bring something uh, like uh, a biogas plant that could be demonstrated to public and other investors. So from this, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Peter and also I think Yahya from uh, Bank Alfra that if someone can bring a business model uh, for biogas plant starting from household level or uh, small like one ton biogas uh, uh, biogas management so how they can manage to finance actually i contacted to uh, some bank uh, mezan bank they are financing solar so if i do have some model basically i am based in germany and i do work with some african partners so we do have some business models that could be adopted at household level and at small industrial scale uh, to be uh, adopted so what could be, because uh, if I go to the investor directly, they are a bit hesitant because they don't have a success story reference unit. So how these organizations like USAID or some bank would be uh, like a partner to convince the local investor that this technology is sustainable and it could be helpful. So if they can, uh, yeah, please. Okay, so you address your question to Yaya. Um, and Mr. Peter, 
And uh, Khalid, if you could please introduce yourself. Um, uh, we were in here. Yeah, okay, yeah. so uh, uh, I'm Dr. Khalid Mahmood. Um, I'm based in Germany in Technical University um, in Cologne. It is in West. So uh, in 2017 to 19, um, we worked on a biomass resource assessment project with NEST. And presently I am involved in some um, bioenergy projects, uh, you can say biomass resource assessment projects together with German partners in Africa. So I do see that uh, the situation that we do have here in Pakistan, some of the African models are uh, some of the models that is already adopted in India that could be used here in Pakistan. But the thing is, in due to the lack of sex, success stories, we are having uh, facing difficulty that to convince the right. investors. Yeah. So thank you, thank you. So yeah, yeah. Do you have do you have anything to respond to Khaled that I would um, probably Al Fala is offering for this financing? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, as a as a as a financier, uh, generally we look at uh, two three things. One is the commercial viability of any project and sustainability of that project. That's very important, which uh, mm -hmm. which the partners can um, uh, help us understand. And the other part is the after sales service and uh, operations after installation. This is another area which we look at. So expertise of the handler is very important for us, how it will be managing and how the uh, vendor and the uh, service partner will be providing after sales service. So this these are two technical areas and the Third one and fourth one are generally the, uh, which are the constraints in respect of access to finance for the farmers, especially. That is the evidence of cash flows and uh, generally evidence of collateral, which they are unable to provide. So for these last two items, uh, the schemes which I talked about, uh, central bank and government initiatives have uh, provided some solution to uh, look at uh, these two constraints differently. So my answer would be yes, if uh, the technology partners, uh, the end user and the financiers, uh, we can develop partnership and we have the solutions um, uh, and we can even find the solutions uh, for a specific market. Thank you, Yaya. I think I have another hand raised from PK Hussain. Um, I'm not sure if the name is right. Yes, this is Sikandar actually, Sikandar Hussain and I'm from Nestle, and Nestle Pakistan. I'm serving oh, in Nestle sorry. Pakistan. Yes, Sikandar. So is thank it my you. turn to speak? Yes, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everyone, all the participants and um, capitalizing on the discussion and uh, the conversation I've been listening from the different participants on the biogas. We from Nestle is actually promoting biogas technology in Pakistan to the dairy farmers. And I'll be speaking from uh, the dairy perspective uh, because the raw material which is actually coming up in the biogas digest that is the manure. Uh, I have uh, heard a couple of people talking about the efficiencies and the economic viability of the biogas plants. Actually, the drivers of the biogas production of the, uh, or if you would be producing gas or uh, you want to produce electricity afterwards through uh, the generators, compressors and the storage tanks, it depends on uh, the hygiene and the discipline and the maintenance of the system. So uh, for us, actually, we find it very feasible for the farmers to produce the biogas uh, as you can produce uh, electricity from the solar as well. People easily go towards solar because they do not find any maintenance system there out. Here in the biogas, you need to maintain the system very effectively because you do have a lot of mechanical components in between. And the success of the biogas story and uh, dairy farming industry depends on how efficiently you remove the sand from the manure. So, before you feed uh, the manure into the biogas register, you have to eliminate the sand out of it. And uh, the suppression of the sand drives the success story. Uh, a lot of people talked about uh, that the system was not successful, very true. Uh, we have seen the systems which were not successful and majority of the system were closed because they never maintained the system properly or either the registers were fully choked with the sand. So in any case, if, uh, if, if, if the farmers or the people or the organization, if they do have a proper maintenance system, if they have efficient cleaning system and uh, they keep uh, isolate the sand from manure and they digest it properly, they have a quantitative system to digest the slurry into the digester properly. I think the biogas, uh, the biogas system works really well. And the cost of electricity generation from biogas is parallel almost to given to the solar system what we are producing. We have installed uh, in 2021 almost uh, 10 systems uh, with a subsidy program through a subsidy program for the cat category, uh, categorically for the dairy farmers. 
and uh, the systems are really working well. And the capacities uh, we are talking about are all are 100 meter cube plus. And then the additional advantage, you can always, you can also have it from the biogas once uh, the gas is already extracted. The post adjusted slurry, you can also remove uh, the fiber out of it and the fiber could be resold to the, uh, to the packaging industry and the water could be used as a very good fertilizer for the, to enhance the crop yield too. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you so much for this intervention. Before I move on to the next to the next question, um, there's um, an interesting aspect of um, uh, uh, the methane thirty percent um, uh, of the methane uh, reduction in um, the recent commitment that Pakistan government has made uh, in uh, COP twenty six. Um, um, how do you see the biogas? potential turning out this way or would be helping to meet this target. So somebody, um, Mohammed Amjad has written this in the chat box. If um, any one of you would like to have some comment on this, if you could raise your hand. I think Omar, uh, Dr. Hina, I think Omar is uh, offering himself. Okay, Omar? Perhaps Kelly. Yes. Please no, Okay, so I can I can speak from my experience with uh, the Landi project. Uh, I was a little surprised to hear that the cost is the same as solar. Uh, but when we're talking about biogas projects again over here, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought over here totally. <laughs> can you please repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. It was about the Pakistan having pledged um, this very recent yes. thing of 26, sorry. yeah, of yeah, reducing sorry. So, the methane and the biogas having. Yeah, so one of the biggest sources for methane production in this, and again, I'm going to talk about the urban areas, but is by replacing uh, the waste that's going into the landfill. Uh, stopping it from going into landfills and converting them into biogas. And one of the main things uh, involved in that is that you avoid long transportation of this waste. If you currently look at the way the system runs in Pakistan, it's extremely uh, ineffective uh, and, and inefficient. Uh, and if our solution for waste in Pakistan has been to create more distributed uh, setup rather than having centralized locations processing 500 or 1,000 tons. The methane um, uh, targets that have been set, I think if we are able to just reduce the waste that's going into landfills in the cities, you will see a significant change. Karachi produces 15,000 tons of municipal waste per day. And out of that, approximately 65% constitutes just organic waste. So that would be the equivalent of 9,000 tons being saved from going into a landfill and producing methane per day. Uh, this does not include all the waste that's collected in a lot of the cattle colonies, which are situated within cities uh, like Karachi Landi, or you have a couple of these also in uh, Lahore, very, very large cattle colonies. They are a major source of methane production as well. And if you if we can produce localized solutions for those uh, uh, producers of uh, waste, then you can deal with uh, the targets that have been set. And I think one of the revenue streams that we keep missing out on are uh, carbon credits. They still exist, they're still a source of revenue. Uh, and I believe that because of the lack of data availability and the fact that a baseline is not established, we're not able to tap into this one. And also the lack of proper consultants who can guide developers on how to incorporate carbon credits as part of their overall financial solution. But yes, if we are to manage urban waste, I think that would go a long way in dealing with the 30% target that we have. Okay, thank you so much, um, Omar, um, for highlighting this. Um, I'll quickly move on to the next question, considering that I would like to keep the time um, as per the schedule and um, with the participants' availability. Um, so um, the next question we have is um, is for, about the women. Um, the uh, because the evidence from the other sectors, they we we see that the women inclusiveness into all levels of the value chain um, um, can lead to can lead to more effective um, um, clean energy initiatives like biogas. So how can um, we see women 
being effectively uh, on board as an entrepreneur and farmers in the biogas uh, market and to establish an equitable sector in the clean energy. Um, there's still a knowledge gap um, at the intersection of this uh, with the climate change mitigation and also um, um, gender equality. That is an impediment to reach the development and the economic gains. Um, so in this regard, I would like to begin this dialogue um, with um, with our esteemed participants who have joined us. I see I would like to begin with Dr. Chitra, who is an on, a female entrepreneur herself, and I think she would be able to begin the talk, and then um, we can walk through the other participants. Dr. Chitra, if you could please yeah. unmute As yourself. As I mentioned before, uh, if you're looking at uh, generating biogas at the rural level, then uh, onboarding uh, women will be very, very easy because they are the, uh, uh, the, the uh, waste generators. They have the control over the waste which gets into the plant. At, at the same time, they are the end users. So they are a lot more conversant with you know, how important this gas is for them because their day-to-day -day life is going to get affected. So if onboarding them will be important. In fact, I would say it is a must that you onboard them. Otherwise, your plant will not be successful because what has happened is we tried in many areas. We, uh, in our enthusiasm, we thought, no, why not collect the, uh, you no, know, connect the toilets also into the biogas, uh, uh, you no, know, digesters because that's a good source of uh, uh, input for you. But then we suddenly realized that most of the women refused to use that uh, gas for cooking. They said, no, it, no, it uses uh, you no know, waste from the toilet. We don't want to be, you know, using it. And, and even though there is no smell, there is no uh, difference in the gas which comes out. But the, the mindset is that I don't want to use it because it uses uh, no waste from the toilet. So you need to onboard the women if you're going to do it at the um, rural level. But it, it's a you know, situation is a little different if you go into the, the um, urban areas. There also, if you're uh, targeting the households, individual household for collecting waste, then onboarding women is very important because they are the one who are going to collect and segregate the waste for you. And then you collect it and take it to the plant wherever it is. It's easier to onboard them. But to run a big, large scale uh, plant, women cannot do it alone. You need a lot of buy-in from the men also, especially the community where you are setting it up. Because what my experience has been, even in the you know, urban areas, where you are setting it up, you have to set it up in the outskirts only. You can't set it up inside a you know, really crowded area because it has its own problems. It, the gas sometimes smells, then you're handling large scale of uh, wet waste, uh, which creates a problem for the people. So they don't want the you know, uh, trucks go, you know, going back and forth, carrying such large uh, quantities of waste. So you need to have the buy-in and then the buy-in of the men in the area because they are the one who tend to create this problem saying that I don't want the trucks going from here. I don't want uh, you know, waste being processed, uh, processed next to my house. So there, uh, women play a little lesser role and running big plants where you need a big compressors and big purification units, again, requires a lot of understanding of uh, mechanical engineering and a lot of understanding of how uh, pressure and gas works. For that, I felt many of the women are not equipped to do it. I myself you know, faced a lot of challenge and I had, a, had to learn a lot before we actually uh, could uh, become successful. So there, uh, women play a little lesser role, but in the rural area, having women is a must for you to you know, make your project successful. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, uh, for sharing this very useful um, experience. But I would also like to hear from the other uh, probably women um, of course, men as well, but uh, especially on the challenges that how we can have an equitable participation of women. Um, kaise khawateen ko ensure kar sakte hain? Jaise pehle, uh, Dr. Chitra ne kaha ki rural setting mein um, uh, effectively on board kiya ja sakta hai. Urban setting mein bhi household level pe uh, um, mumkin hai, but uh, for the to operate large plants, or jaise hume maintenance or uh, operationalize karne ke liye bhi, um, women and men equal participation or probably men support is also required. But the other challenges um, or the other opportunities women can have in this sector, if somebody uh, would like to highlight and shed light on um, with their views, uh, please feel free to. I don't see um, many of the raised hands, but um, 
Dr. Abhya, uh, if you would like to say something about it. Uh, thank you, Hina. Yeah, it's very interesting to talk about it. In my opinion, we have the women community and we have opportunity to provide and we have to empower them, basically. As we were talking about rural community, so, uh, basically, I also had a point raised that we look at that we have the opportunity to have the biogas plant in rural community, but for the operation, ke liye, things are not that much easy ke bas usme waste add karo and that will start operating it. So we need to uh, basically uh, make their capacity building that they can have uh, the operation of those biodigesters. No doubt that would not be that much difficult. I want to basically share an experience that how simple those women are uh, that once we have an interaction uh, with the female who was having the biogas plant and they were basically throwing the uh, water into the biogas plant which was of the uh, like the washing water of the uh, cloths ke jis pe surf hota tha to uske andar to bahut zyada antibacterial agents paaye jate hain jo ke basically wahan ki microbial community ko affect kar rahe the to kya hua ke biogas plant failure ho gaya to jab biogas plant failure hua to it looks like this technology is not working so basically uske piche is tarah ke chote chote technical points jo hain wo involved hote hain so for that matter, uh, we is level ki jo hai na, ek certain level ki awareness jo hai, wo raise karni hai women ke liye ke wo kar sake. Dusra, jab unhe wahan se kuch na kuch revenue generate ho raha hoga, jo maine kaha ke hume unhe equip karna hai, unko empower karna hai, to uske liye koi revenue generation ka system hoga, to they will be more attracted towards that. So, this component is very important to address this component. And if I university level or a broader level, like Dr. Chitra has said that we have the maintenance activities on a commercial scale, there are also women engagements required. So, we have to basically give them a vision to broader an area of practical exposure in this area. No doubt at the university level, we have the courses and all that. But there is a practical exposure to technology ka, that is very important to understand and to troubleshoot all those issues. So usme jo hai na, women ki jo, uh, exposure level hai on commercial scale or global level, ke upar kya chal hai, to that is very important to look at. Ji, thank, thank you, Dr. Abhya. And I think... Um, जैसे आपने कहा कि um, scale building, practical experience देने की, experimental um, experience देने की women को जरूरत है. So recently हमने भी पाकिस्तान में देखा है कि solar panels पे engineers को और skill, skill development programs introduce किए जा रहे हैं how to install those panels. Likewise biogas के भी sector में it could be easily um, ordered ताके um, women could equally um, learn from their knowledge uh, as well as their practical experience. Yes. 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 Exactly. So, uh, so uh, one point add to that, I think that it would be very important if there would be any woman leader who wants to have the biogas plant in their region or community or the university or whatever the scale would be. So do encourage the women to participate and to be a leader in the biogas field. Jee, so that, that would develop a basically a success story na? that women can also do something in this domain, not only the stitching and cooking and all that. So these mm -hmm. kinds of the engineering and professional things women could also lead on. So this would be good to set a yes. role model. Thank you, Rabia. Uh, Alip, may move. Uh, we see your ha hand okay. raised, Ji. So I got my plate, but anyway, uh, I would consider uh, Dr. Chitra's opinion that... Uh, in rural community, we must need to take uh, women on board because uh, they are like working exactly not only um, due to the respect of uh, fuel consumption like uh, gas or fuel use, but also to manage with the waste like in agriculture waste or even in the manure. So it, it, the only thing we need to do it to uh, provide them the technical training and then to uh, reduce their fear that this is not a rocket science that they cannot do it. They are able to do it. It is very easy to manage it. So just we need to bring some like kind of uh, success stories to them that, okay, if some woman like in village is running a biogas plant, so the others will be attractive. 
So, and also the technical difficulties that they are not managed to do, like uh, Dr. Abhya said, that they are not aware of what kind of the consequences could be with the use of this wastewater. So this kind of technical training will also uh, need to be, do, uh, to be done. So I think uh, PFAN and some other organizations can help to bring up such model systems and then uh, to encourage the women uh, in this uh, biogas sector. And similarly, I would say that the, the women in uh, uh, urban communities are also can benefit it. Uh, there are uh, some stories or some reference uh, that uh, India is adopting. And then that is household or community scale biogas plants. And people are using for uh, like uh, the household waste, the organic fraction of municipal solid waste and other fractions. So they can also benefit from this technology. But in rural areas, there is more potential for this technology. So mm, this is... thank, thank you so much. Um, Sikandar from Nestle, if you would like to add something. Uh, yeah, sure. I would just uh, compliment what the speakers have already, participants have already said that, uh, you know, in Pakistan rural community, uh, the women entrepreneurs are really emerging now in the dairy sector. And uh, especially in the rural areas, women, women are the one actually who are managing all the menus. So the capacity building is the key drive. And I would uh, request PFAN to really work on this part that the capacity building of the women entrepreneurs uh, has to be uh, enhanced so that they would have an understanding that what is the drive for the success story of a biogas plant. Uh, for example, in a digester, it can really work if a dry matter content is really up to the mark. By simply adding water inside the digester probably would not be giving you any sort of a gas. So the concept of biogas operation, the concept of digestion, and the, cost, the concept of uh, the gas generation and its consumption has to be well inoculated in the, in the women uh, community of the rural uh, areas. And I think once the success stories are developed there out, once the success, successes are executed properly, then it could be a prototype example for the rest of the women to follow and execute. Uh, thank you so much, Sikandar. Peter, would you like to say something? Um, yes, please. I just really wanted to reflect on the requests uh, and, and uh, um, proposals for PFAN regarding gender. Uh, by saying that gender is really important for both PFAN and the PPSC project in Pakistan. We have a very strong focus on gender. Um, and in, in, we, we try to look at gender through four different ways. Uh, and, and we're really embedding this right the way through our whole operations. And in terms of dealing with projects and supporting clients in the biogas sector or clients in any other sector for that matter, what we're looking for is a, either a focus or a mix of, the, of these four things, which are the, the leadership, uh, gender in leadership, so the actual ownership and governance of the project or the, the company, then um, gender in the management of the company uh, and through the workforce of the company, uh, sort of evenly distributed, so it's not just focused on uh, traditional female roles, but there is gender representation across all of the activities of the company. Uh, so that's the second one. The third one is the supply chain, which I think um, we were just hearing from Nestle as well. So how do we, in, in, in the biogas terms, you know, who do we, how do we source the feedstock? Um, how do we process that feedstock? And then the products we are selling are is gender also involved through the chain into into the distribution and sale of the product and and then the final piece is uh the actual marketing or the beneficiaries the end users um does the project does the company really benefit uh the, the gender agenda um does it are the end clients are the end users uh, women uh, and how does it benefit their daily lives, uh, their economies and their role in the communities? So these are the four aspects that we have identified together with a lot. I mean, this is, this is I think, uh, a growing body of work at the moment uh, that we try to really bring to the, the way we work. Uh, and it's a very strong focus of, and I think Dr. Chitra will perhaps reflect on this, um, through her experience of working with PFAN and the fact that she's here today, I hope sort of represents that this is something that we take very seriously um, in, in supporting her and, and making her a success story. I, I think we've helped contribute to that. 
Um, this is something we take extremely seriously. Uh, we want to identify the women uh, entrepreneurs. We want to help them uh, and support them. And we want to help women through the whole value chain, whether it's in the bio biogas sector or in the other renewable energy sectors that we work with. I've said mm. enough, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. I have a question from uh, Ikra Zaheen. Um, she has written in the chat box actually, that in Pakistan from where um, it could be learned uh, the process and start to, st to start the bio CNG plants as um, she's working in the rural community and um, she's keen to construct different biogas plants to help the rural women. Um, anyone from our colleagues from the bank or from the other industry uh, would like to comment on that? If you could please raise your hand, I would I would know. Probably uh, Mr. Khalid, um, since you have been working with the rural communities, um, the rural support program um, at the household level, would you have any experience to share on the successful biogas models, construction and um, the best practice? Because we have also been hearing about lack of success stories that we could see to help gain knowledge about what is happening and um, what we could benefit from. Well, thank you. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of success stories. In 2014, before the program closed, we did an assessment, a third party assessment. At that time, over 90% of the plants were operational and being well maintained. And since then, customers are calling up biogas companies and every year, maybe 50 to 100 plants are being installed by biogas companies at 100% of the cost. So I think that itself is a major success story. At the household level, as I mentioned in my comment, once the word spread, the woman came to the fore. They started asking their men folk to make the investment to improve their lives. If you re recall in rural areas, the kitchen, especially in winter, is very dark and dusty and you know, not a nice place. But with the arrival of uh, biogas, I went Thank to one. You. I went yes. to one village, and there, you know, the woman said, "Now the difference between our village and Islamabad has reduced to a great extent. That you have gas in your kitchen, and now I have gas in my kitchen." Thank you, thank you, Khalilza, for sharing these um, uh, great experiences, especially um, through the assessment you have done, because we have been hearing about. Um, uh, probably um, there are success stories, but lack of the information sharing, sensitizing um, the women and the communities uh, is of uh, most importance. Uh, sh we have Shushim Man. Um, not, yes. Yes, Good please. Uh, Good thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, in this program. Actually, I'm from Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, and uh, like I would like to share some experiences from uh, Nepal. I've been working in the sector for the last 10 years. Uh, and like uh, as a few of the other speakers also mentioned, uh, in Nepal, like, you know, biogas is considered to be a very successful program, especially the domestic biogas front. Uh, every year we con construct about uh, 25 to 30,000 of these GGC uh, biogas plants. And we have various mechanisms. And in fact, it's the private companies who are actually uh, taking lead on doing this. Uh, and, but now, uh, recently uh, in Nepal, we're trying to transition ourselves from uh, domestic biogas to the large biogas sector, in which uh, we're trying to commercialize the biogas and sell it to uh, the market, right? Uh, and like, you know, as Dr. Chitra, uh, like, you know, on her wonderful presentation mentioned, uh, we have like about five uh, large scale biogas plants up and running in uh, Nepal right now in various places. 
uh, initially it was working pretty uh, fine, the, uh, all the plans, but, but like, you know, we kind of realized that it faces a lot of uh, challenges. It's not easy. And as there's this question in the, on the board saying that like, you know, to transition from small scale to large scale biogas, uh, uh, the thing is that like, you know, uh, you know, first you need to upgrade the biogas, uh, uh, you need to produce it in large quantities. And then of course, upgrade the biogas and then uh, sell it to the uh, users. What we kind of realized uh, is that uh, we work closely with MNRE in India and they have this uh, very strong policies in which like the government uh, via this SATA program is ensuring like, you know, the market for uh, the uh, developers who have opted to install large scale biogas plants. And that is completely missing here in Nepal. And also uh, the standards, uh, st standards for upgradation, for storage, for, uh, you know, these heavy uh, high pressure cylinders, that is uh, also a problem because like, you know, uh, we import stuff from all, all over the world, from uh, China, from India, from uh, Germany, many places. Exactly. So then uh, we lack the national standard. Other countries and we would be pleased to hear from her and see if we can help her further. Uh, so I think uh, in Pakistan, if you uh, want to have an, a good biogas program, then uh, maybe uh, these uh, things could be of uh, importance uh, to, to the sector. Whereas we've, uh, uh, it has been seven years since uh, the first of these large biogas uh, programs started in Nepal, the bio CNG, and uh, we're still struggling with the technical uh, front. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shushim. Um... Thank you so much for sharing these experiences from Nepal. Very relevant to the context of the discussion. Dr. Chitra has um, his uh, hand raised and then Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, see, I, I'd like to offer that anybody who wants to set up a large scale uh, plant, I'd be more than happy to help you because I've spent 10 years in this industry. More than what can go right, I can definitely tell you where things can go wrong and you need to be careful about it. So I'll be happy to handhold anybody who wants, to, uh, wants any kind of help from me. And I would like to definitely thank uh, Peter and everybody in PFAN because yes, uh, no, PFAN mentoring helped me a lot. And even though my uh, uh, association with uh, PFAN started in 2013 and I was supposed to be uh, you know, under mentorship only for about six weeks or about a, a, you know, a few months, but till today, uh, my, I am in touch with my uh, mentor and every single major uh, you know, policy decisions which I take, I go back and consult my uh, mentor. And I am a first generation entrepreneur. Nobody in my business, in our family has ever been into business. So I did make a lot of difference and a lot of uh, mistakes. And I, my mentor was there to handhold me and uh, caution me at every step of the way. That helped me a lot. So I owe a lot to the PFAN family. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for, 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 for this great um, offer and uh, help and support. Um, I also see from a chat box that um, Peter has um, suggested to link ICRA uh, to successful models in the other countries. And if she could contact um, Azil Jabbar, who is also in, on this call. So just wanted to convey this. Um, Khalid Saab, do you want to add on something? Do I see your hand raised? So I think I raised my hand when um, Peter did not answer okay. and now um, we already asked that Ikra can get help, but in case uh, if she need help in Pakistan, so there are many um, domestic scale biogas providers. So if um, Ikra need help, she can also contact me. And depending upon the area, I can also provide the link of local uh, biogas uh, manufacturer. So that is. Thank you, Peter, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, I I was not sure whether to come in or not, um, uh, and and the hand you saw saw previously was an old hand, um, but but perhaps just to reinforce, you know, at this stage in the proceedings, that the PPSE program in Pakistan is here to support companies to help them face some of the challenges that we're talking about, and that then that's why we're having this conversation, ready to help identify the challenges, uh, help us understand them better, and be able to provide a better service to. Uh, to project developers, company owners, and entrepreneurs that are trying to work in this space. And, and I think we can help companies address some of the technical challenges they have, 
we can help them address some of the uh, sort of financing challenges they have in, in de-risking their project and presenting it to investors and, and then actually help the conversation with investors uh, once they're a bit further down the line to actually make the deal happen. And you know, I think that, that's what we did in Chitra's case. Um, it, it takes a long time, it's a lot of work. Um, it, it, it requires a lot of patience. These are not things that happen automatically, but this is what PPSE and PFAN is all about in really providing that support to uh, entrepreneurs, to companies, to projects, uh, and, and helping them through everything that they need to do to, to reach financial flows. Thank you so much, Peter, for this. And I think um, with this, I would like to go on to the last question we have, the guiding question, if we could move the slide, Santiago. Yes, so that brings us to um, highlighting, you know, barriers to wider implementation of biogas in terms of challenges, opportunities, and the lessons that can be highlighted for the sector in Pakistan, any regulatory support, any um, improvements in the existing policy, any um, policies that could be highlighted. So, uh, Dr. Chitra, I see your hand raised, if it's from the previous session, no. So if anybody else um, would like to have their intervention for this, to have a kind of a, um, um, I, I know that we have had a lot of discussion on the challenges, the opportunities, the lessons for Pakistan, but any um, other uh, intervention that anybody wants to make in the term for the wider implementation of um, an upscaling of the biogas potential in Pakistan? Yes, please. Um, probably a technical issue, uh, Ahmad, uh, do you want to? Uh, yes, uh, it's a, obviously it's a very important question and I would request all the participants and I would like to slightly rephrase these questions and we'll address this question to the participants who are having their small biogas plant that what is actually needed to convert their small biogas plants into large plants? Because from the discussion, this has been evident that the large plants they are more financially viable so what are the what are the main hurdles and what do you what is your expectation how can you convert your small uh, biogas plants into large biogas plants so this question is from all the participants any of the participants who is managing uh, small uh, biogas plants like uh, i know the uh, Ikra Sanders profile, she was also making a small biogas plant, Mr. Kastam Solangi, or anybody else. Jo bhi small, chote level pe kaam kar rahe hai, ki wo apne kaam ko bade level pe karne ke liye inko kya kya chizhen chahi hai? Thank you, Hamad. Um, should we start here from hearing from Khalid? Ji, ji, salam alaikum. Ji, ji, welcome, salam. Haji Mohammed Kasam Solangi Batkaro, Bahawalpuse, Joe Mary Company of Kanama, a Pakistani Green Biogas Company, Arbame, Julie, 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 वो भी डब्ल्यूडब्ल्यूएफ के पास था तो उसमें एज मैं टेक्निकल इंस्ट्रक्टर के तौर पर काम किया था तो वो सिर्फ बायोगैस के ऊपर ट्रेनिंग हमने जो ना वो की थी जो इलाके के लोग थे उनको मेन हमारा इशू जो होता है ना वो ये होता है कि हम लोग जो प्रोजेक्ट लॉन्च करते हैं उस प्रोजेक्ट में हम लोग फिक्स कर देते हैं कि भाई 15 क्यूबिक मीटर का है या 20 क्यूबिक मीटर का है या 50 क्यूबिक मीटर का है उसको फिक्स करके हम लोग आगे लॉन्च कर देते हैं वो प्रोजेक्ट हमारे हो जाते हैं फेल मेन जो इशू होता है वो इस तरह होता है कि जब भी हम प्रोजेक्ट कोई भी लॉन्च करें तो आगे फैमिली और उसके घर के अफराद हो जितने भी हो उस अफराद को देखकर फिर उनके घर के जानवर जितने हैं उसको देखकर प्रोजेक्ट को लॉन्च किया जाता है वो सबसे बेहतर रह जाता है क्योंकि फिर उसी हिसाब से बंदा प्रोजेक्ट को जो ना वो बायोगैस का प्लांट उनको लॉन्च करके देता है बना कर देता है ताकि वो कामयाब रहे अदरवाइज वो प्लांट हमारे फेल हो जाते हैं दूसरा आ, दूसरा यह था कि भी अवेयरनेस के ऊपर बात हो रही थी मेन इशू हमारा यह होता है कि हम लोग प्रोजेक्ट लगाकर चले जाते हैं उसके बाद अवेयरनेस किसी को भी नहीं देते हम लोग 
अवेयरनेस ना देने की वजह से हमारे प्रोजेक्ट जितने भी होते हैं पैसा जो भी इन्वेस्टमेंट किया होता है जो फंडिंग का होता है या खुद करते हैं या किसी से भी हमारे पास आया होता है तो हम उसको उसको रेज कर देते हैं बिल्कुल खत्म कर देते हैं क्योंकि उनको पता ही नहीं होता है कि इसको चलाना किस तरह है पर क्यूबिक मीटर गोबर कितनी डालनी चाहिए एक क्यूबिक मीटर गैस में कितनी गोबर डालनी चाहिए कितने जानवर होने चाहिए बेसिकली उन चीजों को इन चीजों को किसी चीज का पता नहीं है गोबर को साफ करके डालना पड़ता है क्या तरीका कार है कितनी गोबर डेली डालनी है गर्म पानी उसमें डालना है नहीं डालना ठंडा पानी डालना है किस तरीके से ये अवेयरनेस उनको बिल्कुल नहीं होती मेरा जो होता है काम वो होता है टोटल जो फैमिली मेंबर है प्राइवेट तौर पर मैं काम कर रहा हूँ पूरे पाकिस्तान में किराती में मेमन गोट हो गया और गुज्जो ठट्ठा बदीन वाली साइड के ऊपर मेरे प्रोजेक्ट लग गए हैं सौ क्यूबिक मीटर दो सौ क्यूबिक मीटर हजार इवन और हमारे पाकिस्तान बड़े अगर हम लोग छोटे लेवल के ऊपर करना चाहते हैं तो फैमिली मेम्बर को देकर प्लांट हम लोग लगाए तो हमारे कामयाब रहेंगे और अवेयरनेस उनको कम अज कम हमने एक साल दो साल की अवेयरनेस उनको देनी है जो घरों में है जो फीमेल है खातन है उनको हमने अवेयरनेस लाजमी देनी है अवेयरनेस देंगे तो उनको पता होगा किस तरीके से चलाना है क्योंकि खातन इस प्रोजेक्ट को चला सकते हैं मर्द नहीं चलाते मर्द सिर्फ कहना है और चप्पर के चला जाना है और खातन इस प्रोजेक्ट को कामयाब तरीके से चलाते हैं दूसरी बात है कि हम लोग बड़े अगर यानी कि मार्केट में हमारे पाकिस्तान में लगे हुए हैं एक दो प्लांट हमारे लाहौर में लगे हुए हैं रिंग रोड के ऊपर बोर मुनीर इंडस्ट्री में प्लांट लगा है जो जियो मेमरीन शीट के ऊपर वो पूरी इंडस्ट्री इस चीज के ऊपर चला रहा है लेकिन वो है कि भी उसको प्रॉपरली एक जरा मोनिटर कर रहा है तो वो जबरदस्त चल रहा है और उसके साथ ही एक रिंग रोड के ऊपर ही है हलोकी इंटरचेंज के ऊपर वो क्रिएटिव इंडस्ट्री वाले हैं स्काई पावर वाले उनके पास बड़ा है जो जियो मेमरीन का है अगर बड़े लेवल के ऊपर हम लोग करना चाहते हैं तो फिर जियो मेमरीन को हम लोग फोकस करें वो आगे लेकर उसको चले अगर हाउस होल्ड के ऊपर हमने करना है तो सिर्फ उसकी फैमिली और घर के अफराध जितने भी हो उस हिसाब से और उनको अवेयरनेस और जितने जानवर उसके पास हैं तो उनको प्लांट दें जितने के पास जानवर नहीं है तो उसको प्लांट नहीं दें जी थैंक यू Uh, shifting from a small uh, scale plant to a bigger plant theoretically there is no difference uh, the technology remains almost same but uh, where the difference comes in is you need better purification unit and you need a compression unit to bottle the uh, gas and this is where the whole uh, plant uh, commercial viability depends because most of the time we tend to import uh, machineries which we are not in a position to maintain it at the ground level so you need to have enough spares to make sure that your plant uh, runs on a continuous basis and there is a background you have enough spare parts to service the thing because these gas this gas you can't leave it in your digest room or digest room for more than 2 days if you don't use it it just goes off and if you need to uh, you know, bottle it and keep it then you need to make sure that your plant runs the machinery is run uh, as efficiently as possible and you have enough spares for it for example if you you need a purification unit for say 200 cubic meter uh, gas per day so instead of setting up a 200 cubic meter purification plant we set up two units of 100 units each so that one fails then you have a fail you no know, fail safe and you have uh, your plant still runs because your customer is not going to wait so this is what you need to be very very careful is that as much as possible source local technology or even if you are importing the technology you have enough knowledge and spare parts to service it at the local level that's what will make it successful in the same and second thing is you need when i kept uh, saying again and again that government intervention is very very essential in one other aspect this is in, in important because the moment government starts promoting biogas in any form from whether uh, they are giving subsidies or they are helping uh, you know get uh, uh, subsidized rates of loans what happens is when one or two units become successful there will be a mad rush from everybody everybody wants to set it up because they are seeing somebody becoming successful and that that's where the problem comes what happens is there is you know everybody jumps in and you don't get enough feed stock to do it because you are uh, fighting for the same feed stock in the same area so what we have done in uh, india in different states the state government uh, has in, uh, stepped in and said if you want to set up a, a biogas plant say using uh say paddy straw so for each district only two plants will be allowed government will not allow you to set more than two plants and the first come first save basis uh, no two plants will be allowed so that you don't struggle or don't fight for the same raw stock so that way we are making sure that those who are setting up because uh, you know if you are setting up a large scale thing the uh, large scale plant 
the investment is very high. It's capex heavy. So you don't want those plants to fail. Because the more the plants fail, the more the people's trust in this uh, industry and the technology goes off. So government is ensuring that the plants don't fail so that they know they are giving a lot of subsidy, but at the same time, a lot of restrictions are also there uh, to make sure that the plants are successful. So these yeah. are certain things which can be you know, implemented. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. And I think that just like I said in the beginning, that if we're looking for the broader implementation of um, uh, the biogas and shifting specifically from a smaller scale to a larger scale, it needs to have improvement in the um, on the policy um, level and um, the existing policies in the key areas that you have already mentioned in the maintenance on the maintenance side and the, on the technological side, awareness raising, capacity building. All these components are really essential too uh, for the way forward. Uh, moving on, I would um, request at okay. So we we have um, Sikander from Nestle um, who would like to say something. Yeah, sure. I would just be adding uh, one more comment to the top that you know when you are switching over from a low capacity to a high capacity biogas plant, for example, you're talking about two meter cube, three meter cube, five meter cube for the domestic application. So whenever the gas is coming out from the register, you just have to purify it through the filters and use it there in the kitchen appliances. When you're talking about the high capacity biogas plant, for example, 50 meter cube, 100 meter cube, if it's not a community product and if it's a product by a dairy farmer who is actually who wants to capitalize to produce electricity from the biogas, then he would be involving a lot of other machineries and components that need, that, that need a storage tank it needs a compressor, it needs a generator that should run on the gas as well too. So the competence of how to maintain these equipments is very mandatory because before uh, that gentleman or a lady starts working on these machines, she must understand how to operate these machines because we do not want to end up into an industrial accident because of the ignorance of uh, the knowledge of the, about these equipments. So when we are talking about uh, uh, paradigm switchover from uh, small capacity to high capacity units. We are also talking in the same site about the competence building of the people as well, so that it, the model should be really successful. Uh, we have done the same exercise. Uh, the farmers actually have uh, have increased the capacity of the existing biogas plants from 50 meter cube to 100 or 200 meter cube, and now actually the the, the big farms are also coming up showing their interest uh, in the biogas generation as well. But the baseline is the competence and, uh, and uh, the knowledge lifting up. Uh, if they have that adequate knowledge, they can really run it out on a very optimum way in an optimum way and the efficiency can be really enhanced. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Um, thank you, Sikander. We have uh, Umar Vaisnavi. Um, you've been um, writing in the chat box about some of the suggestions. Um, probably I can give you a floor to speak up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, this, this subject is very, very close to my heart and I've spent so much time uh, trying to, you know, get something off the ground over here. And a lot of the issues that are being highlighted are things that we've already faced in the past and, and we kind of figured out solutions. I, I think it's a matter of I understand the need for agricultural based solutions and rural area support and uh, you know female empowerment all of these things are extremely important however if we are to make a serious dent in the kind of pollution that we are causing in the country and the side effects of that pollution be it in the cities or in the rural areas uh, we need to consider a more a concentrated approach. Uh, there are departments, as we heard earlier, who are already dealing with uh, the rollout in uh, rural Punjab in particular, and I'm sure other provinces will follow suit. Uh, however, the largest share of the waste uh, in terms of organics is being produced near uh, population centers, and therefore there, the opportunity exists for easy... Uh, you're muted, Umar. Sorry. So the locations, uh, having them in the right locations near major metropolitan areas or population centers uh, would actually allow for us to make these projects in a more financially sustainable way. I understand all the frustration of not having the financing and the banks not listening. And I think the large corporates have it 
relatively easy because they're able to access a kind of funding for their projects, but individual developers don't get that. But my thing is that unless there's a concerted effort to create larger solutions based on population centers, and we keep going to more micro-based solutions uh, for the rurals, uh, it, it won't have the kind of impact that we're hoping for in the next, well, we've got a nine-year clock now uh, on the, the targets that we've signed up to. And if we, if we were to take that seriously, I think we have a very good example in India, uh, which we can follow. There's a lot of things which are fairly similar over here. And I think uh, the network of our highways and the new expanding network of our highways might provide a very good uh, artery for us to base projects around that artery in order to ensure minimum wastage and minimum use of fuel for the transportation of uh, the raw materials. That's my two bits. Mm, thank you, Omar, for the, for the great suggestion. Um, I would also like to encourage, because um, I realize we also have some project developers with us um, in the participants. Uh, please, please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand if you would like to have any question, suggestion, comment uh, with regards to the biogas. All right, so we also um, see um, a suggestion from Dr. Bakir Raza, uh, who has suggested to have established group where participants could be a member and they can coordinate and share their views on the issues and also adaptation of the latest technology. So a kind of a platform where these um, good practices, practices, success stories could be shared um, and um, uh, each individual could support um, one another um, in overcoming the barriers and the challenges they are facing in their age, you know, domain and the sector. Some wonderful interventions made by our participants um, uh, in this regard, and um, um, especially in terms of um, uh, what I could highlight in terms of capacity building. Okay, so yes. Um, um, Amar Qureshi, um, would you have anything, any intervention, any suggestion to add on? Thank, thank you uh, for that uh, intervention. Uh, my just uh, my my uh, my question would be to all the participants. We have been hearing from some of them about uh, challenges they are facing in finance, but uh, I would like to hear more from the departments, whether project developers or even from the financial institution side, on what sort of uh, suggestions do they have as far as access to finance challenges or biogas plants are concerned in Pakistan. So thank you, Amar. Um, so what have been the challenges in accessing the finance? We have been hearing about some of the incentives, some of the financing mechanisms that uh, our colleague from al Fala and um, um, from uh, uh, Yahya, yeah, uh, he has mentioned a little bit about um, the initiative of Pakistan Kamyab Jawan program um, for women financing, this, the, the, the financing scheme of the state bank. Um, where do we see the challenge in accessing that finance? Where are the where are still um, the, the barriers? There are the gaps to access that finance, and the people have been facing. So, uh, Umar, I see your hand raised. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things uh, that we've come across, and I think uh, there, were, there was uh, a, somebody on the panel who mentioned this, uh, you know, in a small comment that the problem that we have is no collateral. Most of the project developers are people like us who are running on day to day cash flows rather than having a substantial amount of equity backing us up. <laughs> so, what, so when, you, when you don't have that money available or you have no collateral available, the banks, even though the facilities are available, even in the case of solar, a lot of the times the banks initially refuse financing without any collateral even though they were supposed to collateralize against the panels themselves, which creates a big problem for the banks. I'm very well aware of that. 
Uh, I think the problem is two pronged. Uh, the banks require uh, technical expertise, which do not exist uh, at large scale in Pakistan. Uh, and they also require some sort of uh, visibility on the kind of cash flows that you're going to have in the next coming uh, years for the next five or 10 years of the project. And unfortunately, most of our developers are coming from the small, medium uh, side of uh, business in Pakistan, and they're not aware of what all they can earn from these projects, uh, tapping things like carbon credit, uh, carbon credits, extra revenues from there, what to do with the slurry, what to do with the biosolids that are left behind. Because while all of these things are a bit of an issue, at the same time, they provide financial opportunity for the project developers as well. So I think there might be a thing here that we have a very good team of people in this uh, event right now. And if you could make a more focused group that could actually help different developers that are working to develop a certain size project anywhere in Pakistan, it doesn't matter if it's in uh, the Fata area or all the way down in uh, the Makran coast, uh, it should be irrelevant as long as the feed stocks there, the technical expertise should be available in a localized solution where we can reach out to them, help them with the technical side of things, help them with providing guaranteed solutions and maintenance over the next decade. An individual company will not be able to guarantee that because none of the big players who tried to come into biogas have had any kind of sustained success in this, and they've all shied away from it. There are very few people like me and a few others on the panel over here today who've kind of stuck it out and are still trying their best to make sure that uh, biogas becomes a larger scale solution. So I would suggest PFAN could lead that effort, maybe bring in technical experts, both within Pakistan and from the international markets. There are plenty of companies that we've spoken to in Europe, in North America, even in the Far East, who are very happy to come over here, share their expertise and train our people over here. If you have that core efficiency available, if you have the core uh, expertise available, I think the rollout will become easier uh, for the developers and it will become easier for the banks to finance these projects. Thank, Thank you. you, Umar. Ghazil, um, would you like to add on something? Thank you, everyone. And thanks, Umar. I think very valid comments. I would just like to build on uh, you know, a couple of things. You know, Umar and I also had a, a chat earlier and I think you know, this is exactly what uh, the PFAN PPSE program addresses and brings to Pakistan. Uh, so this is really to support uh, the, you know, the SMEs that are operating in Pakistan and who don't have the capability uh, to, to, to really go out with a, with a more polished product to various banks. So we help develop those cash flows. Uh, we help uh, bridge those gaps uh, to, through the right uh, access to um, you know, collateralized um, guarantees, uh, you know, the adequate collateral, uh, proper cash flows, um, developing the whole business model uh, and, and, you know, sustaining the right commercial viability for each of these projects. Uh, so that is really the core, uh, you know, uh, value addition that, you, that we bring on to this project. And then we give access to uh, equity investors and lenders, you know, while, uh, you know, we're um, uh, developing the project, we are also building relationships uh, with various banks, lenders, um, access into guarantee schemes, access into low cost funding programs. So we bring all our projects uh, which are on board with us uh, and give them proper access into equity investors and, and the right lending products. Um, thus creating the, you know, the, the financial advisory aspect to this. Uh, so I would encourage all project developers, you know, especially you know, all on this call to contact me uh, I will share my email address again, um, and you know, so you know, you know, we would encourage you to apply with us, uh, so we can give you more personalized support across uh, your projects, uh, especially in the biogas sector. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much, um, Vasil, for um, elaborating on this. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I can take a. Um, yeah. Thank you, Hina. A quick comment. Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, Hina, government sector is dependent of uh, linkages and partnerships. So, uh, 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 Ghazami Sab has validly pointed out that there should be a forum where uh, all the stakeholders uh, of demand and supply side should sit and uh, understand and uh, communicate. Uh, financial sector development taking place in recent uh, uh, times have uh, uh, provided uh, uh, sufficient room and confidence to the lenders 
to uh, go for collateral free lendings uh, at least i know few of the banks including ours which are accepting the solar solution as a collateral right now and uh, there are few other programs where uh, uh, government of pakistan and central bank is uh, extending guarantees to the bank uh, in an attempt to ask the banks to not ask for the collaterals from the borrowers so there are solutions the missing link is the knowledge flow so i would strongly urge to have a forum uh, where where uh, uh, the stakeholders can develop some solutions uh, for the end users thank you so much yeah yeah and i think this brings us to the um, um to kind of wrapping up this discussion on the dialogues and uh, i must say um very fruitful um, and informative dialogue that has happened on identifying the status um, of biogas in pakistan um from all technological um, economical and financial perspective and we have been hearing the perspectives from the bank from the financial institutions and uh, from the stake other stakeholders and i really appreciate everybody's input um, everybody's interventions that has helped us so like santiago also mentioned that we'll be releasing a white paper on this after after that so i'm sure that the inputs and the suggestions we have collected today will be um, uh, feeding into that white paper in a very uh, informative um, manner and um, we look forward to this continued engagement to this discussions on the focus group um, um, groups and also the working groups that um, uh, we we are uh, suggested to make in the pfan um, uh, um, um, to be played in this um, with this i would like to give a um, to hand over this um, mic to peter again uh, for the closing and i thank you um, um uh, from my 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 side uh, for the fund to providing me this opportunity to moderate this very informative session and i look forward to our continued um, engagement thank you thank you hina for your masterful moderation and particularly for managing the urdu english aspect as well so well um i i tried to follow as best i can and my colleagues will help me i'm sure fill in the gaps that i have so I have the, I think it's an, I, I'm not sure whether an enviable or unenviable task of trying to sum this up. Um, and I'm not really going to try if I'm honest, because there have been so many good uh, thought provoking and really sort of well founded experienced contributions that we've had. Um, so I'm not going to try to summarize in terms of getting towards conclusions already. What we will do, we will certainly take all of the thoughts and contributions that we've heard today and feed them in and we will develop a, a summary and, a, as we said, a white paper uh, with some suggestions coming out of this. Uh, and we'll share that in draft form when it's a little bit further advanced with all of you on this on this round table uh, and, and request your sort of review and anything that we've missed or further contributions. What I would like to do is just to summarize some standouts from me, the sort of the key takeaways, if I could just take a few minutes. And the things that I've noticed, you know, some of the last points, the, the summaries, there's certainly a need for uh, some sort of forum, a gathering where we can exchange uh, and, and channel uh, the huge amount of technical knowledge, commercial experience and, and, and financial uh, cap capacity that we have so that all of that knowledge uh, can go in the right directions and useful directions and it can also be used in the conversation with, with government and policymakers. so that's one big thing that is coming out for me um, i mean I, we've heard a lot about the challenges around lack of collateral around the feedstock issue i mean you know this is something that we recognize and hear and encounter in all of the sort of uh, companies that we support in other countries so that's no surprise um you know we've heard about the resource intensity problem in pakistan i think which is perhaps something specific at the moment the need to really concentrate on uh, the logistics and the infrastructure around the feedstock so that that feedstock which is there as we heard from dr rabia that that feedstock can be really used in in a really um, useful way and and optimize it rather than than, than just use it perhaps 
Uh, we've heard that there are financing programs out there, perhaps not enough and perhaps not well enough uh, communicated. PFAN can certainly help with making sure that where they are available, we connect them with the developers and companies that do need them. Um, so I think that's that's one area that we can we can make a big difference. Um, I think another conclusion that I'm drawing is that there is obviously a difference and we perhaps need to focus our own, well, all of the sector on this. There's a difference between the small household scale, the rural scale, and then the commercial scale. Slightly different challenges, slightly different requirements, uh, although it's the similar or it's absolutely the same chip technology as Dr. Tritra pointed out frequently, but the challenges and the opportunities are different. And perhaps in the development of those projects and the support and the financing of those projects, we need to focus our resources accordingly. We've heard about the opportunity in the dairy sector. Uh, we've heard about the need for in, or the importance of, of maintenance and care to make sure that the, the technology actually works and provides the yields that are necessary to get to any sort of commercial operation uh, and financing. And, you know, I was really pleased to hear the conversation around gender. Uh, and, and that is something that PFAN will certainly com continue to support as, as we go forward. We've, the, the sort of, the, 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 the overall message I'm taking is that there's a tremendous opportunity. We need to invest a tremendous more amount of effort in realizing that opportunity. And what I think we as PFAN can offer, as PPSE can offer in Pakistan going forward is the support to make, not all of it, we can't do everything, but in terms of the project identification, the project support and development, and the financing facilitation, those are things that PFAN, PPSC in Pakistan can help with, and we will do. And to that end, um, I think I will thank you all uh, for your contributions, for your, um, uh, for your participation today. Thank you, Chitra, for joining us. Great pleasure to see where your project has got. I remember talking to you uh, right at the beginning, and it's been fantastic to watch your journey. So thank you for sharing with, with, with us today. Uh, Dr. Rabia, thank you for all your contributions and expertise. And Dr. Hina, thank you so much for moderating this discussion. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, it's been enlightening. It's, it's, I hope for everybody else, it's been extremely useful and interesting. It certainly has been for me and I'm sure for all my colleagues. And it's a fantastic base for us at PPSE to take forward uh, and get more involved in this sector. Uh, the last person I have to say thank you to is USAID. Um, and without USAID, none of this would be possible. Uh, and uh, we'll shortly be joined by Rabia Bukhari, who is our uh, contracting officer's representative at USAID. She looks after us, she moderates us, she guides us, and she makes sure that we stay on track. And she is the person who's ultimately responsible for PPSE. Uh, and what we're providing in the Pakistan market. But before I hand over to her, what I would like to do before we close finally is just ask everybody to turn on their cameras, even the shyer ones amongst ourselves. We would like to just take a screenshot of everybody um, and uh, we can use that on the cover sheet of the white paper or, or whatever else uh, communications that we might use. So if, if before handing over to Rabia, I could uh, just ask everybody to turn their cameras on uh, and we will just take two minutes to have a screenshot and then I'll hand to Rabia Bukhari at USAID to, to finally close the round table. Santiago, just, or, or Mavra, tell, tell us when you're, when you're ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm just going to give everyone just a few more seconds if you would like to turn your camera on. Okay, I think we have a good enough number now. So one, two, three, say cheese. Great, uh, let's just take one more, if that's okay. Make. 
Okay, let's say biogas this time. Okay, one, two, three, biogas. 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 <laughs> okay. Biogas. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, so much. Uh, and this uh, this event, uh, I was live tweeting and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I was putting um, up posts, and uh, some of you I found online. Some of you I could not. So I, in the chat, I have been bothering everyone for their designations and their uh, handles. So if you like to share that in the chat with me, because I'll be doing other posts again as well. So we'll definitely tag you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mavra. Um, without further ado, thank you to everybody. Rabia, over to you for the final closing. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I'm Rabia Bukhari. I work for USAID and NG office. Uh, and on the behalf, I will not take much of your time as we have already gone through a long session. Uh, first, let me actually begin thanking you all basically for taking the time out to join us today and uh, really sharing your real time experiences and lessons learned and unfolding some of the important aspects of the biogas sector in Pakistan. So I've been really listening to all the conversations from the start, I really enjoyed and was feeling amazed basically about the discussion, lively and engaging discussion which we have held. And uh, thank you very much. Um, to everyone, especially and uh, the organizers like the PFAN team, uh, Dr. Rabia, Dr. Hina, Dr. Chitra, other participants, I cannot name every one of you, but um, I'm really grateful that you have shared your experiences with us. And we really look forward to take on these discussions further as we have already discussed. We do not want to stop it right here after the round table and continue this to address the bottlenecks which we are facing to actually promote this sector to take forward further. So I'm really glad to see some of the talented and intelligent and um, knowledgeable experienced women out here as well today, uh, besides our knowledgeable experienced um, men experts. So I will not say that only women, but it's, it's good to see the women out there today, the representation the, in the participation and otherwise uh, in the listening session. So without further ado, I would like to thanks again and say um, Allah Hafiz, I hope you also enjoyed the session and found it informative. Thank you. <laughs>